Hello, Armando. Hello, Derek. I thought it would be interesting to discuss the many mistruths and myths surrounding Mario Lanza. Armando, this is something you write about in the introduction to your Lanza biography, An American Tragedy, that maybe no other singer has been the subject of so much misinformation and been maligned by gossip as much as Lanza. Derek, you've told me that the pages that are the most visited on MarioLanzaTenor.com are the myth pages the artist and the man myths about the man is is yeah. the, uh, the most read one and then the artist is the second most read one so i thought it'd be interesting today to address some of those myths and dispel them sure no, so we'll start idea. with the first myth that you point out on the website eh, derek which is that lanza possessed a small voice and i just thought we'd lead off with you derek <laughs> um, with that ridiculous ridiculous myth it is ridiculous, and it's, it's it's one of the most frequently regurgitated myths, you know, on on YouTube. If you go under any Mario, you know, posting, there's always something about uh, about him having a small voice, and it's it's incredibly frustrating. I I think that it it developed because you know because he was a film singer, and I love the comments that you know that Richard Bonning and Joan Sutherland made to Armando back in the '70s that you know they they were expecting. A smaller voice too because he was a film singer they didn't really know much about his stage career probably uh and they were they were amazed you know by the size of the voice but you know it's one of those myths that just gets regurgitated all the time as i was saying and um but it's so easy to refute it i mean um a few years back i was in correspondence with joseph kalea uh one of the you know the, the reigning tenors at the moment and he told me that you know he'd run into grace bunbury the soprano and she had heard mario you know in concert and was you know she immediately said it was an outstanding you know the voice was there was definitely no problem with the size of the voice it was a fully bloomed lirico spinto tenor voice uh, of outstanding quality and you know it filled the theater uh, there was no question in her mind about that but i mean if people just took the had the patience to go and just investigate a little bit they would see that this is a ridiculous myth how can anybody sing at the royal albert hall in london without a microphone and and fill the, fill the entire theater it's i mean that's yes. an 8000 8000 odd uh, auditorium uh, the same goes I mean, all through Lanza's career, he sang in some very difficult, acoustically very difficult venues. Uh, for example, the New Orleans Municipal Auditorium, where he did um, uh, Madama Butterfly, and uh, he he filled that without a microphone. Uh, Syria Mosque, during his 1951 tour, Syria Mosque in Pittsburgh, uh, 4,100 seats, and filled that without any problem whatsoever. Uh, Max de Shaughnessy, I think it's how you pronounce his name, who was a tenor of some repute, he went along to see Mario at the singing at the Philadelphia Academy of Music. And the first thing he wrote in his review was that, you know, there's, there's, let's say right off the bat, that there's no question that he, you know, that he, that he could not fill an entire theater and be heard, you know, perfectly what on every corner of the theater, no question about it at all. But then we have people like Robert Merrill, who, who said it was a large voice. And he knew Mario. Mm. Uh, Robert Merrill was a you know very distinguished baritone, and he knew what he was talking about. Uh, his own singing teacher felt that it was the voice of, of the next Caruso. Uh, Leach Albanese, she uh, she commented on the size of the voice as well, and she sang with Mario. Uh, there are so many people. Jess Walters, who was the sharpless, uh, when Mario made his professional debut in, in Madame Butterfly, uh, he said that uh, Mario had the squeal the the, the squealo to penetrate the entire theater, you know, to be heard above the rather thick orchestration and in a very difficult acoustic environment. Um, so these are just some of the names. So it's absurd, but it's really irritating how often this comes up, even by people who ought to know better. Um, Krista Ludwig, you know, she, she wrote something in her autobiography, a throwaway comment that she had heard that Mario had a small voice. Uh, there was a conductor some years back, Stephen Mercurio, who was conducting a tribute to Lanza by Joseph Kalea, and he made this throwaway comment to the New York Times that, uh, of course, Mario couldn't be heard in a 3,000-seat theater. Now, he later retracted that, but, you know, the damage was done. These are the kind of comments that get thrown about carelessly by people who didn't hear Mario 
in person and don't have a clue about what they're talking about. So- it's, a, it's a common theme through, as we'll see through a lot of these myths, that they're used to chip away uh, the greatness and that's that's obviously a very easy cheap shot with a, a tenor voice armando you, you've obviously spoken to singers and musicians that worked closely with them and th- it was a common theme that he did have the vocal goods and the, the the voice had substantial size and substance absolutely i mean there's no question about it that anyone that knows anything about singing or the voice will tell you that with that colouring, with that sort of timbre that he possessed, there's no way that that could be a small voice. No way, impossible. And all the the people that I spoke to, a lot of them, Derek already mentioned, but the list is endless. I mean, from Kusevitsky to Tebaldi, Albanese, Kirsten, you name it. Uh, You know, I used to bait them and say, yeah, but I said, what? Small voice? What small voice? Couldn't sustain? Nonsense, absolute rubbish, which is what it is. But when you are that famous, it's the tall poppy syndrome. You know, he became a sensation overnight. Uh, Successful and a celebrity. So the, the knives are out. Yes. Who is this guy? What? Playing Caruso? What's his background? He's not sang any, any operas. Well, in fact, he did four performances, but you know, he did not sing at La Scala. So they are judging him by the fact that he hadn't sung at La Scala. Who cares? I mean, with a voice like that, with a talent like that, that musicality, I mean, come on. Hmm. He would have left them all for dead. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> Ferrara, the, the conductor, the conductor, the, the famous Mario, he said it was a voice, a powerful voice, a combination of steel and warmth. I love that. Because quote. I painted him also. I said, but I said, he said, he said what? Small voice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, really, it, it's totally, but I mean, one, we can go back as far as 1942 when he made his debut as Fenton in The Merry Wives of Windsor. The critic of the Herald Tribune, the New York Herald Tribune, Virgil Thompson, called it a splendid, dramatic, dramatic, underlined tenor voice at 21, which is what it was. Because he learned to scale down after, after studying with Rosati, Rosati said, take it easy, there's plenty of time for the dramatic stuff, sing more lyrically, which he did. To good advantage. So, you know, the, the, this rubbish about uh, the small voice, this myth, you know, you, 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 can, you can put it to sleep forever because it, it, it's simply exactly that, mm. a ridiculous yeah. myth. Just recently, just last week, I was talking to my father and who he heard him at Usher Hall and he, he expanded on that and explained that the voice was big and rich and beautiful and, and he even used the word thunderous, you know, that the the, the high notes rang like a bell, you know, that it, it was just a beautiful voice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an awful, awful myth and it's a cheap shot actually. Mm-hmm. That I was talking to John Weaving, the Australian tenor, who'd come back to Australia after singing for quite a number of years overseas. And he heard Lancer at Yelbert Hall as did Richard Bonning and John Southern and many others. And he said to me, that was the greatest tenor voice I ever heard. And, you know, you're talking about the Albert Hall, 8,000 capacity with lousy acoustics back in mm-hmm. 1958, mm-hmm. have since improved. And the voice was just that, ringing, round, fabulous. And he repeated, mm-hmm. John Weaver repeated a statement on a program, the ABC program Singers of Renown. He said it to, for all to hear. The greatest voice I ever, tenor voice I ever heard was that of Mario Lanza. So. And the thing to stress is that was that was a sold out house. So, the, I mean, the yeah, dampening yeah, of sound yes. um, as well with a full house. The acoustics were notoriously bad mm. at the Alberto. 
So, you know, the, the mere fact that the agents, Columbia artists, were contacted by uh, the London management and said, oh, you know, we're worried that he shouldn't be singing at the Albert Hall, it's too big, Festival Hall is better, he mightn't be heard at, uh, at the Albert Hall, and the answer from Columbia artists <laughs> came very promptly, don't worry, Mario Lanza will have no problems being heard at the Albert Hall, that's how sure they were. <laughs> The voice was what it was, and yeah. fabulous. Just fabulous. Yeah. And it was pointed out to me by by uh, one gentleman who was at both the Albert Hall concerts that it was winter time. Everybody was wearing sound absorbing thick winter clothes, which made the acoustic even worse. Mm. And the voice still rang out with that bell like quality that your your father said to you, Vince, yeah. uh, when he heard him in Edinburgh. Um, and you know, and he sang and Mario sang at a lot of big venues during that fifty eight tour. You know, some, you know, in, in, in Germany, for example, in Kiel, uh, apparently it was a huge cavernous venue. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it is a ridiculous myth and hopefully we've I, put it to bed. I'm, I'm glad he did sing at the Albert Hall because it would have even kept that myth alive even more. But the Festival Hall is a much better uh, venue. They, they were right about that, but I'm glad that he took the challenge on and succeeded. The second myth is that Mario never performed a complete operatic role. And we know this isn't true, but another one that we need to dispel. So Armando, could you talk about Mario's operatic experience? Well, it started off when he won a scholarship at Tanglewood and he made his debut as Fenton in The Merry Wives of Windsor and he received rave reviews. I mean, Kusevitsky has heard him, called it uh, a voice that comes along once in a century. Mario went along, learned the, the role in about six weeks, which is pretty good. He was 21 years old, received rave reviews. They did two performances of Fenton. He then sang the third act of Bohem, also at Tanglewood, um, as a student. And then, of course, the army interfered and he lost three years because he went into the army from 1943, two years actually, 43 to 45. And then um, after he came out of the army, he studied with the great teacher Rosati, with Benjamin Ugili, and eventually he made his debut as Pinkerton in Madame Butterfly in 1948 in New Orleans. And that was supposed to be the beginning of his operatic career. He sang two performances of Pinkerton successfully, as Derek mentioned before, very successfully. Um, I mean, the, the reviews were fantastic. And I spoke to, um, I was lucky enough to be able to talk to both the soprano, uh, who sang um, Chocho San, um, Butterfly, and Tomiko Kazanawa, and also the um, mezzo-soprano Nadell, and they both told me it was a wonderful voice, spinto sound, it looked fantastic. And the year after, he was supposed to do Traviata, also with the New Orleans Opera. And by then, of course, he'd already skyrocketed to fame. Uh, Be My Love was selling million copies, and there was not enough time to follow through. Like, you know, you, you have to learn and have time to learn the role of Alfredo, well enough to be able to perform it. And, uh, and by that time, time had run out. I mean, he was just too busy in Hollywood. So the myth that he did not perform in opera is not, first of all, it's not true because he did sing those performances. And then there were offers for him to, to, to do other things. Uh, and again, you know, there was no time for it. Uh, you can't do both, you cannot. So not only is it not true, but when he did perform operatically on stage, it was to great success. So it wasn't because of some sort of failure or it not going well. It, he, he was a great success when he sang operatically. Absolutely, fantastic success. success. I mean, the, the, the Pinkerton that he did receive rave reviews. Um, as I said, the, the singers that I 
spoke to uh, and, and the sang the butterfly the soprano and, and the mezzo soprano uh, confirmed that also going back to to tanglewood i think i spoke at one stage to uh the soprano that sang and and she confirmed the fact that it was a great voice and erma gonzalez who sang with him in in the bohem uh, third act also raved about the voice so look there's no question that had not hollywood come around or approached him uh, mario would have been sensational in opera and this this has been uh, said not by me, but by George London, who predicted that uh, he, he would have had a, a fantastic success in opera. Uh, Lee Chalbanese, uh, you name it. I mean, just about everybody, just about everybody. So Armando, he didn't possess a small voice. He has sung complete operatic roles. So maybe somebody would try to undermine it by saying, well, it's a soprano's opera, Butterfly. Could you maybe... Um, expound on how difficult uh, Pinkerton is actually and with the Puccini so orchestration so, so is Tosca Soprano Opera so is <laughs> Traviata Pinkerton is a lot more difficult than one thinks because uh, first of all the, the first act is quite long almost an hour long and there are incredibly long passages of sustained singing for both the soprano and the tenor there's at least four B flats which are very difficult to, to attack. There's a lot of singing with the baritone uh, in, in the first act. So, you know, all in all, it's a pretty difficult role and one that if you don't approach it carefully, can be very tricky. Uh, Domingo said it's, it's a lot more trickier than either Cavaradossi or Rodolfo. <laughs> So he doesn't sing in the in the second act, but he does come come on again in the third to sing the the aria di Fiorito Gil. But sticking sticking uh, sticking strictly to the to the first act, there is a lot of demanding singing, and it requires a voice which has got enough ring squillo to raise above the orchestra to be heard in a terrible auditorium like the one in New Orleans, uh, which had the capacity of about from memory, 2,700 seats, you know, which is, La Scala has got just above 2,000 seats. Now, this is 2,700 with terrible acoustics, so, mm. you know, that tells you something about the sort of voice that he... And, and the, the bravery to maybe even start with a Puccini opera because of the layered orchestration and how yes. hard it is to sing yes. over a Puccini orchestration. Puccini plays the melody. So the melody doubles the singing. And if you don't have a voice that has enough ring in it, you're not going to be heard. I mean, there's a typical story of Nicola Geda being asked by the Stockholm Opera as a debut to sing Pinkerton. So he went along to his teacher and he said, well, they've offered me Pinkerton. And they said, what? Absolutely not. <laughs> they said, they won't be able to hear you. Your voice is too small. You know? <laughs> and in the end, he managed to convince them that he wasn't going to do it. And he didn't do it. What he did sing was, you know, Elisir and uh, Lamico yes. Fritz and uh, Don Pasquale. This, sort of, this is the sort of voice mm. for uh, that sort of opera, but certainly not for, for Madame Butterfly mm. or Pinkerton. Damn it. If you could just, the run times of operatic onstage time for, uh, will you tell me Tosca, what was the run time? Uh, Tosca was, um, I think if I'm right, it's, it's less than 30 minutes of singing, no more than 30. For the tenor, for uh, Cavaradossi. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it's a, it's, the, the difference between the two is that, you know, Cavaradossi has more to do in Act 3, but, you know, Act 2, he's, he's only on there for a couple of minutes, uh, admittedly for an exciting moment, but that's it, you know, he... Um, there's actually, 
at least another 10 minutes singing for Pinkerton. And as Amando has pointed out, very demanding singing. The B flats, the high C, the, uh, you know, it's, um, he's, got to, he's got to stay off stage and come back. It's got to be off stage during act two, which is difficult you know, to be off stage all that time and stay in character, stay primed up to sing and then come back in act three, knowing you have another short but difficult aria. Again, with a B flat, you know. So the, um, the, assumption, the assumption that it was some sort of negative, that he hadn't had the operatic experience and he didn't have the stamina or size of voice, when in fact his quite extensive concert career demanded a lot more of him vocally of an evening. Oh, yeah. um, sure. You're on stage for sometimes an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah, and you're exposed. I, I just would like to say one thing about the, the operatic performances that you know, Armando touched on there that I think it's incredibly unusual if you look at the careers of, of you know, many of the great or well, so-called great tenors, the acclaimed ones, how many of them had the kind of reviews that Mario got on his debut? Both the, you know, the uno- let's say the unofficial debut, Fenton, Mary Wives of Windsor at Tanglewood, and then the, the professional debut as, as Pinkerton. I mean, as Amado mentioned, both of them, you know, terrific reviews. I mean, how many tenors or how many singers get a review when they're 21 saying that they have few equals among singers of the day? Yes, in terms of, point. you know, the, the quality of the voice, plus your musicality is being praised, diction, uh, acting, uh, the musical characterization of Pinkerton was singled out in one of the reviews, uh, you know, exceptionally beautiful voice. And if you go back and read Domingo's early reviews or Corrales or Delmonico's, it's, it's, there's no comparison. He had it right at the beginning. And this is one of the great ironies. There wasn't that struggle to work his way up. He, he could have had any role that he, you know, sung any role that he wanted. Uh, if the fates had been different. And, Armando, um, Armando, could you talk about even, for example, then Caruso's uh, early struggles with his voice, which, which Mario didn't have, it was completely natural and all there, that in his early reviews, um, that might be interesting. Yes. Well, uh, it's important, uh, Vince, to distinguish between a completely natural voice and an acquired one. By an acquired one, I don't mean you, you walk into a shop and you say, I want to buy a, a voice. But you already have the voice, but you have to work. You have to work to build up the uh, notes, extend the register, work on the passaggio, which is, you know, the critical uh, from chest to head voice, which is around F, F sharp, G. And a natural voice, a natural voice is a very rare compared to acquired voices, very rare. A voice like Lanza, that sort of voice is even more rare. I mean, it's unique. Now, poor old Caruso became a great singer, but he sweated, you know, the, 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 the pains of hell in, in order to, to acquire that sound. Because when he started off, he had nothing. Nothing at all, just a tiny little voice. He, he, he used to crack on an A flat. When he went to Guglielmo Vergin, his teacher said, I'm sorry, but you know, uh, there's not enough and I want to teach you. And this friend, Caruso's friend, implored Vergine, give him a chance. And uh, so Vergine did. And eventually Caruso, through sheer determination, hard work, managed to achieve what he achieved, which is not insignificant. Having said that, natural voices like Lanza, Di Stefano, and your own country man, John McCormick, are rare. Mm. Now, you know, they're saying, yeah, but Lanza didn't study enough. It wasn't, uh, that's nonsense. Because when you have a voice like that, you do not need years and years of study unless you want to make the teacher rich or increment his bank account. Well, that's right. I mean, you know. McCormack went to Sabatini in Milan, to the great Sabatini, to be, to be heard. He wanted to study with him. Sabatini heard him and he said, well, there's not a great deal I can teach you because nature gave you everything. McCormack studied for less than a year. Di Stefano, two months with Montesanto, the baritone, a couple of years on and off doing vocalizing with uh, a member of La Scala Chorus, a tenor. Mm. Lanza did 15 months with Rosati, which were enough mm. to enable him. I mean, what Lanza needed was really 
to learn how to uh, support properly, breathe properly and support properly in order to sustain. Because he said himself, before Rosati, I used to tire. Now, the secret of being able to sustain a performance is the breathing. Well, you yourself know that you, 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 you're a singer. It's breathing, but also, also learning to pace yourself. Depending on the opera, I mean, there's operas and operas, but young singers learn to pace themselves through repeated performances. Now, Lanza would have had to do the same had he sung regularly in opera. He would have known that, for example, in an opera like uh, Trovatore or Turandotto, Otello, particularly, you really had to pace yourself because with a singer that had his passion, that sang with that passion and intensity, this was important. He had to pace himself. I mean, there's a there's a classic case and rather a funny a funny example of what happened. I mean, it happened to a lot of singers; they ran out of steam. But uh, there is a, a a funny episode of Di Stefano being offered Otello of all things, he was 45 in 1966. So he's, he's offered Otello by the um, Pasadena, Pasadena Opera Company in California. And uh, mm, Otello, well, you know, well, yeah, I'd like to sing Otello. Well, of course, who wouldn't? I mean, it's the most demanding in the Italian repertoire, tenor repertoire. So he, he accepted and then he said, okay, well, what am I going to do? So he asked Tito Gobbi, not only to be Giago, but to direct the performance as well. So they went there, rehearsed in Pasadena, and eventually, you know, first night of the performance, Di Stefano somehow manages to get through the first two acts, and then he doesn't show up for the third act. <laughs> Di Stefano, <laughs> Di Stefano's oh, wife, oh. Maria, went uh, went uh, to to uh, to see Tito Gobbi. And she said, look, uh, he doesn't want to go on, you know, he, he, he's exhausted, uh, he says he's got no voice, uh, he won't come out. So Gobby goes to the dressing room with Stefano and he said, you got me into this, now you're going to finish the performance if I have to kick you all the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this Lord. Stefano, this Stefano did go on and he managed to, feel, to finish the performance and actually I've got a recording of it and it, it's amazing because you know the voice is shot you can tell that it's not an Otello voice but what he does mm. interpretation wise is oh, wow. phenomenal I mean you know oh, I'd like to hear he, that he is a great Otello from an interpretation point. And you can forget about that the voice is shot and that he's, you know, struggling a little bit. Who cares? I mean, it's, it's fabulous. But he sang two performances and then never, never went back to it again. That's a brilliant story. <laughs> but I mean, you can hear him, you can hear him on uh, uh, an LP that he did and he does the um, Dio Mi Potevi and uh, New Mi Tema. It's quite fabulous. So the fantastic operatic career aside, that, that's not in dispute of people like Domingo or Caruso. But when you're talking purely about voices, purely vocally, he has a much more impressive tenor voice than even Caruso. And I know that's going to shock a lot of people, but but he does. Oh, no, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I was just thinking actually of, of George London's comment that he to the music historian Henry Pleasants, uh, just in terms of the actual the, the voice. Uh, he said that Mario had more natural vocal endowment than almost any other singer he'd ever sung with or heard. Um, so they had this extraordinarily, uh, you know, Peter Herman Adler, the conductor who conduct, who was sort of a mentor to him, you know, said he had the most incredible, incredible broad voice, a voice without limitation. Um, I, I like what you know Joseph Kalea has talked about that you know that the the lower Mario's lower register was was impressive, uh, the middle even more so. Um, you know the, the the incredible beauty of the timbre, and then getting and, and then this effortless upper register, all you know all three registers perfectly uh, knitted, let's say, and without any point at which yes. the sound 
uh, lost quality. And that's yeah. incredible. Just this, uh, I always liked the comment that uh, Kalinikos made the first time he heard Lanza sing uh, when he was accompanying him in Schippensburg at a concert. He hadn't heard Mario sing until the actual concert. And he, he felt that a tremendous joke was being played on him because, you know, not only was it the most beautiful voice he'd ever heard, but he, the voice was so beautiful that he could never have imagined hearing such beauty. And I think that's the effect that Lance's singing had on a, a lot of people, probably almost everyone that heard him, actually. Their jaws would drop, and uh, it's that kind of voice. Uh, that's a great point about the three registers, and they're, they're all as, as beautiful as each other in, in different ways. Even that lower register, that baritonal register, I, I, I find even more thrilling at times on something like Will You Remember on a line oh, yes. like, Will You Remember This Day? It's just beautiful what he does with that line. Will you remember this day when we were happy? That actually, that recording is a great one to show to people because the, the range in it, you know, it's a good couple of octaves, from low B to high you know, B flat or something. And it's, it's, you know, he's just leaping about the place effortlessly going down, as you said, into the very low, that's some of the lowest um, singing that we actually get from him. Yeah. Um, the third myth on the Mario Lanza tenor website, Derek, that you bring up is the incapable of learning which is quite broad topic. I, I think it specifically talks about learning rules. I mean, it, it, it's such a, again, another ridiculous statement that he was incapable of learning. As Amanda has already pointed out, uh, Lanza learned the role of Fenton, which is not, not a particularly small role. And, it's, and the, but the music actually is very, very difficult in it. He learned that along with Act Three of Bohem in, in less than six weeks and, you know, and performed it, performed both twice. Um, that should be proved to anybody who, who claims that, that he was incapable of learning. And he had no problems learning the role of Pinkerton uh, when he was working with Layla Edwards. And she's, she's talked about this. And she was a great coach, a great vocal coach. She'd worked with a lot of people, a lot of the, you know, the really big names. Um, and she was very impressed with his, his incredible retentive ear. She would simply play the phrases and sing them to him, and he would sing them back to her, and uh, he would just learn immediately. He would get it. He would just simply retain it uh, because of the incredible musicality that he had. And this is something which keeps coming up all the time, and it should be remembered. You know, musicality um, that helped him so much. I don't mean musicianship. I'm talking about musicality, but the fact that he was so musical that I think that helped with his ability to learn, to memorize. Would you agree with that, Armando? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Borning uh, and Sadler said uh, he had this great innate musicality and he could have had an outstanding operatic career. You know, that says it all. Borning was no fool. He knew what he was talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So all this uh, nonsense being spoken about, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. I mean, he, he sang the entire and the rest of the year for uh, Gaetano Merola, the uh, uh, artistic director and conductor of the uh, San Francisco Opera, who was dying, begging him to come to San Francisco to open the season in 1950. He went to Los Angeles to you know, ask him, implore him to come over. Lancer invited him to dinner, and before dinner, he sang the entire, the entire part. Now, what did he do? Did he just, uh, you know, get someone else to, to, to prompt him? No, he, he had learned that along with uh, Turido in Cavalleria Rusticana, Cani in Pagliacci, he knew all those operas, mm -hmm. Rodolfo. Of course, to sing them, he would have had to go over them again with. Uh, sure. Yeah. A repetitor, a conductor, but again, you know, targeting uh, someone, uh, yes. ah, but he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. Why? Because he was just too good and too popular. Yeah. And I resented yeah. this. I resented it. I think also with the learning, it's not just in terms of opera, but in any of the music that he could learn so quickly. Uh, oh, when yeah. he was doing his radio show, he was having to yes. do yes. four numbers a night. And had to learn them very, very quickly, those four, those four songs, or sometimes arias as well, and, you know, go into the studio, the, rec the radio 
record a studio oh. after having worked at MGM that day and, and learn these songs so quickly. Also yes. in The Great Caruso, people forget how difficult the music is in The Great Caruso. Things like the sextet from, from Lucia di Lamamor and the Otero <laughs> Dio from, from Aida. This is all very difficult music that he mm. was able to learn very quickly even though it was only sung in excerpts, but it was still very, very demanding music. And he was singing with, you know, top singers from the Met and who were, of course, bowled over. You know, if you want to talk about the impressions of Lanza, you know, these were mm. singers who just you know, openly embraced him. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. So he, he was a very quick study. And also, you know, if you look right through his recording career, uh, the albums, for example, one of his best albums is the Mario album, the collection of Neapolitan songs that he recorded just after he'd finished shooting for the first time. He finishes a film, goes straight, he, he only works on the songs a couple of times with the conductor, Franco Ferrara, and then he's got them. He's got the songs perfectly. I yeah. mean, he's just, he's living the songs and he's in the studio recording these brilliant versions after just two or three weeks of familiar, if that, that's someone who learns very quickly and absorbs it and feels it. Uh, it's incredible. It's another cheap shot. It, chipping away his intelligence musically, just his own natural intelligence. As you say, he was learning scripts, he was learning songs. He was, I mean, the, the capacity to get the stuff ready so quickly shows great learning skills, great learning skills. Absolutely. And also, you know, in his films, having to learn dialogue as well. You know, that was the things that must have been, you know, he was having to do all this at the same time. People forget that he was, you know, he's having to, he was having to act, which was not something which came naturally to him necessarily, for, you know, in, in the craft of film acting. Operatic stage acting would have been a different thing. He would have been a natural for that. But he could act impressively in, in films as well. Hmm. Uh, but he wasn't, you know, it wasn't his, his comfort region, it's his comfort zone rather. Um, but, you know, to have all that happening and still be learning songs and arias, to me, that's incredible. But he does. Uh, he does have some great uh, on-screen moments, though. I, I really. Oh, sure. I don't want to denigrate his acting. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, I know you wouldn't. Can I just say one thing there that about these myths? That the thing that always amuses me with when I'm dealing with operatic snobs, particularly, is that if you manage to satisfy them on one myth, like for example, they bring up, oh, he had a small voice. So you you quote all these people like Bonding and everything at them. So you've convinced them of that. They can't use that one against him, but then they'll come up with another one. Ah, but he didn't know how to learn roles. Um, so when you've convinced them that actually here are the reviews, here's Butterfly, <laughs> Mary Wives of Windsor, top critics, uh, then they'll find another myth because mm. they'll keep looking for reasons to, as you say, chip away at him. Uh, they'll say, well, he, you know, he, um, well, he was a horrible person or something. Uh, they'll, they'll find something. And this is what I found again and again and again in, in dealings with kind of sort of third rate operatic societies type people, um, you know, who aspire to be Caruso and are not Caruso. And I was talking to my father last week, cause I was telling you, and we talked about this and you know, it was almost this jealousy and even professional mm -hmm. jealousy, but what we, what we both agreed on is that it's almost like Mario's almost too good to be true. So that's where the lies come up because he is almost too good to be true. Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, look, I've always felt it, it, it was a mixture of uh, envy, too good to be true, envy, snobbishness, <clears throat> ignorance, and, and just stupidity on, on the part <laughs> of these people because they, they couldn't accept the fact that this guy was absolutely unique fantastic a talent that comes along once in a lifetime so you target him you know and uh, you try and find uh, faults that don't exist because they didn't it was just too good the, the, he, he was the whole package the yeah. entire package i mean looks charisma bucket full of charisma a voice with no limitations just beautiful coloring temper everything so you're going to target it, you know, it, it, it's, it's what people do. That's a great point, Derek, there, where you said that if you clear them up on one, they'll come up with another. And it, the fourth myth is a perfect one where they would come in, where they would say that Lanza always shouted musically <laughs> and not knowing his recordings and the subtlety and beautiful phrasing at times. Yeah, I mean, at, at his final concert in Germany in 1958, one of the, the critics, one of the things he singled out was Lanza's pianissimo. It was just so gorgeous and delicate. 
uh, just so perfectly spun. This, I found that quite amusing. Um, I spoke about this a lot with people who heard him live. One of the things they often said was they were surprised by the sheer delicacy of his singing. You know, they that that heard the shouting myth. There are a few instances where he does uh, overdo the loud pedal, let's say. And unfortunately, some of those cases are the uh, operatic recordings he made in 1950 uh, for RCA and other ones which are most most commonly heard of his operatic recordings. And a, about half of them are fantastic, but the other half could, uh, could be a bit more subtle at times, especially in terms of the volume. So I think that hurt him. The only other occasion I can think of is the Albert Hall recording, where I think because of the, the size of the venue, he was singing. I think he may have been sort of overcompensating for the size of the venue. He pushes the slightly, doesn't he? He pushes slightly. And you, know, you get the impression sometimes you know, he wants to make sure that he is heard properly and uh, over, <laughs> overdoes the volume. But uh, these are very small criticisms. There are, there are countless examples. I, I'd even say that those early recordings you're trying about 1950, I think there was a lot of youthful exuberance. I mean, he's mm. bursting out. Yeah. Testosterone is. Yeah. <laughs> His intelligence musically developed after that. I mean, he was, was he 29 at the time? And he's being judged operatically on what he did over a couple of nights when he was 29. Yes. Um, you know, people aren't sort of taking into account the totality of what he recorded and listening to the numerous other operatic recordings, uh, like the ones for Serenade or listening to the live recordings from Hollywood Bowl and, and, yes. and many other uh, performances that we have. One of the things I used to hear a lot by a woman who had heard that, the great Caruso record, which is not, of course, a soundtrack album, it's, it's a studio album. Oh, he's always sharp. Well, that's because he, he was having a sharp night. On the, on the night that he recorded four of the arias on that yes. album. But he wasn't always sharp, and he was often a lot more subtle than he appears on, on that particular album. And, you know, th these are the kind of things he'd be beaten up with all the time, criticized for. Um, and especially by the critics, you know, for example, Gramophone, and, you know, they'd call him a bull in a china shop all the time. And, uh, you know, vulgarity and lanza are essentially the same thing. That kind of, mm. kind of and that really, as you say, that really is just pinpointed to 40, 1949, 1950 recordings that are a bit bombastic in Hollywood. Armando, would you like to talk about that there was a lot of subtlety and intelligence to, to his phrasing, that there, there was no shouting in general? Well, uh, I mean, all you've got to listen to is not just a few recordings. First of all, I mean, the 1949 50s recordings uh, were areas which were done out of context, like someone that hasn't been singing regularly in opera is singing areas, which is a lot diff more difficult to do out of context. You know, if you haven't actually sung them in an opera and you're just doing a recording, it's more difficult to do. It also has a lot to do with the conductor. Now, I won't mention names. <laughs> now, <laughs> but I mean, you know, all you need to do is listen to, to the entire uh, yes. recording legacy. The, the, who else can sing and express like he does? Uh, in uh, not only in operatic areas, but in, in songs like mm. caressing uh phrases in someday begin the begin uh, all the things you are there's no one that compares with him someday you will seek me and find me someday of the days that shall be until you whisper to me once more Darling, I love you, and we suddenly know what heaven we're in when they begin the beginning. And so. There's a lot of a tremendous amount of light and shade in that scene. Oh, yes. A tremendous 
amount of light interest. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Prince, I mean, it's a great example. I mean, Golden Days, things to, like that. If I, if I have to single out one operatic aria, I immediately think of a Luceva and Listelle, the commercial recording. I mean, with some lousy orchestral accompaniment, what he achieves there is, is miraculous. Mm. I mean, it's a great... Luceva and Listelle, it's a great Cavardossi. Imagine hearing that on, on stage live. I mean, forget... Forget yeah. all the others that would have all uh, uh, been jealous of uh, of a voice like that. The ones that are jealous are not the uh, the great singers. The ones that are jealous are the would be singers. The ones that never made it. Oh, but lots of this, lots of that. Who are these people? Nobody's. But you talk to the great ones. I mean, I spoke to Bergonzi. I spoke to uh, Pavar Pavarotti. Pavarotti. Who? Unbelievably, I couldn't believe what he was saying. You know, he said, no, no, no. I was lucky when I started that, there were a lot of better singers than mine. And uh, and then we talked about Lanza. I said, well, Lanza had a better voice than me. Pavarotti said that. Hmm. He said it was darker, rounder, more ringing. He could hmm. sing a wider hmm. repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> 1993, Richard Attacker, the voice of the century. Yeah. That's what he coming from another the tenor. voice of the century. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad, coming from an antenna, Titus, uh, the greatest voice ever heard in a, in a young man. Uh, oh, you know, you can go on forever, quality. We've talked about those 1949-1950, but the poetry he pulls out uh, with um, the Bohem aria in 1949, mm. his first recording session, I just think, well, I always, always gives me chills, that recording. Yes. Yeah. Oh, 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 badly conducted, badly conducted, very badly conducted, and in fact, the conducting, the tempi, make it more difficult to sing Cageli mm. da Manita. It, it, like, Mario is, is given a, 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 a more difficult task because of that inadequate accompaniment. And he does an incredible job. I mean, yeah, you know, that's incredible. That's, that's a great recording. Vocally, and what, what's the 1950 operatic recordings I mentioned earlier? I mean, I don't want to be too harsh on them, but when I was talking about there are some instances where there should have been a bit more subtlety. But what is amazing, miraculous to me, is how many of them were, you know, were extraordinary pieces of singing. Uh, considering, you know, that they, as Mando was saying before, they were sung out of context. Uh, Mando's already mentioned the Elisheva Nestelle, uh, which is, for me, a definitive version. There's the improviso, uh, you know, there are I mean, incredible things that he was doing. Um, actually, both arias from Andrea Schoenier, really. Mm. And, Ma Paris, um, Ma Paris, so, Ma Paris is beautiful. Uh, hit, yeah, yeah, Ma Paris, of course. How can I forget Ma Paris? Um, you know, you could say, okay, they're a little bit hit or miss some of the sessions, but the thing is that he produced such miracles in each of these sessions anyway, even if there were one or two, you know, that maybe were a bit sharp or whatever. Or, but we shouldn't, you know, that, that's what people will and focus also, on. Those, and those, also done in the madness of Hollywood, and sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The worst yeah. possible creative environment, well, the, the non-creative environment, environment for him. Yeah, completely wrong environment, uh, certainly not uh, conducive to, uh, you know, uh, the right approach to, to, to what, what should have been uh, operatic singing or, or otherwise. It was just working in the wrong, wrong environment. And what he accomplished, I think, at the age of 29 is amazing when you consider that Caruso at 29 was nothing. Mm, Nothing yeah. cracking all over the place and trying to find his voice. You know, Mario was a, a, a natural phenomenon that unfortunately went to Hollywood. I wish he had never done that. I don't care about, you know, the fact that he became popular. We have his films, big deal. You know, he, he would have done, he could have done that anyway, like uh, some of the others did. Yeah. Uh, after they became established in opera. Uh, mm. Gigi made films, which are terrible films, but he made them. He was already established. He said, okay, give me the cash. I'll take the money. And go, Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but, you know, RCA really <clears throat> missed so many, ah. squandered so many opportunities. They, I mean, even if they, you know, never got around to getting him to record a complete operatic album, they at least could have compiled a proper operatic album collection when they did put an all operatic collection out the great caruso which was only half, only half of the eight arias on the album were actually in the film but to put only eight arias on an entire album mm. uh, when he had done things like mapari and other things you could have added they didn't yes. put the improviso in there um you know there's no there was no representative 
album of his operatic singing, you know, that, that well, you could say the serenade soundtrack, but that that's about it. And that was a mixed bag. Mm. Um, there was no representative great operatic album in his lifetime. Or after, because all the compilations that they did after that are abominable. I mean, uh, you yeah. know, they, it's a hit and miss. It's a mixed bag of uh, fantastic to... to they, do they actually almost but, ruined his reputation, actually. Yeah, actually. they yeah. fuel the myths. Yes. They fuel the myths. Fuel the myths. Um, you know, these bargain basement covers, the tacky covers, everything everything about the album is tacky. From the cover, it, it, you know, to the content, no logic applied to the selections, no... Mm. no uh, this is it's so frustrating, really. And, you know, if Mario had perhaps been a more aware, aware of posterity, perhaps, perhaps maybe he would have put his foot down and said, look, you're not, you know, doing me right here. You're not representing me properly. Because, it, you know, it's very, very poor showing for a, for a major company like RCA not to put out proper collections mm. and not even to grace them with decent covers or, or decent liner notes to give them, to treat him as a proper artist. Uh, you know, and Serenade is the closest we get to a proper operatic album, but it's still a soundtrack album. You know, so it's, a, yeah. it's got a few things which don't um, really belong in an operatic but, album. Uh, Derek, a lot of damage was done also after after he died. You know, with sure. uh, the Definitive, the Ultimate, and you've got Best things of. like uh, the Lamento di Federico, 1952, uh, Lesiana, which is uh, hysterical, you know, it's over the top. Well, it's a much better one <laughs> from 1955. And then you've got yeah. an Amorti Vieta, which is no good compared to the 55. Yeah. So yeah. then really the compilations are laughable. I mean, and they did a lot of damage because anyone buying a CD will say, wait a minute, is this supposed to be the great Lanza singing this Lamento, yes. you know? Yes. And we can't blame people for not knowing that there were far better versions. This, I mean, you know, I always cringe when people, you know, play play the wrong version of something, uh, thinking that was the best that Mario could do with his with his voice. You know, um, a substandard recording. Um, there are so many. I mean, like for example, the o Paradiso. We talk about a 1950 recording, mm -hmm. 1955 Again. one, which is so vastly superior, is always ignored. That goes to Mario's intelligence and understanding of his, his approach that he re-recorded <laughs> arias. He knew that there was a better performance in him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, but... There are many also, examples of that, actually. Yeah. That, you know, Amorti Vieta, the Mando mentioned, the Lamento de Federico, uh, um, El Paradiso, uh, Vesti la Juba. Yes. I mean, he, you know, I mean, the 1951 is exciting, but the 58 one is much better and much closer to Canio yeah. uh, and much more moving. You know, there are so many examples like that, actually. Uh, and not just the operatic material, but also, uh, you know, things like Neapolitan songs uh, and Italian songs that he often sang better later when he was in a better creative environment. Um, but you know, also, and at, at Warner Brothers, you know, he was working with better people than he'd been working at RCA, I think, in terms. Mm. You know, and he'd been coaching with, you know, Giacomo Spadoni for the, um, for the Italo and or for the other operatic items. Uh, and it really paid off. Yes. And, you know, people talk a lot about his wasted years, um, but he was working on things like Otello, which was probably his favorite role. Uh, he was working on this material, which he put into Serenade, and uh, he wasn't entirely wasting the time when he was the so-called wilderness period where he wasn't doing much. He was conscientiously working away at his singing. This is like 1954. And, you know, we see the improvements. Yes. A more mature artist. A, yeah, much more mature artist, actually. Armando, could you take up the fifth myth that Mario didn't have a proper vocal technique, which is ridiculous? <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, that's, I mean, totally laughable. Didn't have a pro proper vocal technique. We were talking about uh, natural voices and acquired voices before. Now, if you listen to Lanza pre-Rosati, that is before he started with the great teacher Rosati, the 1945 stuff, it's all there. It's already there. I mean, the placement is perfect. The entire range is there. There's no problem in the registers. There's no problem in turning on the passaggio. It's all there. All he needed, and he said it himself, I need to learn, I needed to learn how to support. He said, because I used to tire before that, but Rosati taught me how to use the diaphragm correctly. Mm -hmm. And from there on, I was fine. And now I can sing without getting tired, four hours without getting tired. So technique, that's technique. 
and more, you, you don't more have to. Too, isn't he said he learned to sing yes. more with yes. less pressure. I mean, uh, it, it, it's yeah. if anyone knows anything about singing, I mean, you listen to his his early recordings. Uh, God, it, I mean, he had it all from the yes. beginning. He needed very little in he, order he, to. That's, that's right. That's a very good point. I mean, people so, keep questioning why did he need to go to Rosati when they hear something like yeah, some of the things from Rizzati, the great moments Rizzati, of music, and uh, yes. live radio show, like mm. you know, "Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody" or the Italo at the other end of this, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. the difficulty level. No, um, no that was incredible for a twenty-four-year-old, as you mm. say, who hadn't really studied voice that much, but because of the of the natural, the perfect placement. A of tremendous the natural gift. London said they called it uh, the greatest vocal instrument uh, ever bestowed upon a human being and the most beautiful voice in the world. George London, London, London who knew a thing or two about him because they sang in uh, about a hundred concerts together, you know, uh, with Francis Yen. So, yeah, it was just a, a voice that didn't need, didn't need a lot of work because it was just an exceptional uh, instrument, a great instrument. It's amazing because I've I've heard these first five myths that we've covered so many times with my uploads to YouTube and I'll see the comments and I get angry and I could laugh at the same time. It's such a strange emotion. I see these little things chipped in all the time, just trying to this maliciousness and just trying to undermine them. And it, as you say, it's from people that don't understand. Because if you understand, if you hear Mario Lanza's voice, you know it's it's a beautiful technique. It's natural. He he has a beautiful, big, rich voice. Why you would come to these conclusions is just crazy. But this sixth myth, which I think absolutely stems from being involved in Hollywood and musical excerpts from operas and those films, is that Lanza made recordings in small pieces, which I actually wouldn't have a problem with, even if he did, if it made a perfect recording. In fact, I wish he had at some point. Derek, maybe you could lead off with this one. Yeah, I've I've always had the theory that 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 maybe it was Boris Godolsky, who um, Mario worked with at Tanglewood, who took an instant dislike to him because they were temperamentally complete opposites. Uh, you know, Mario was this fun-loving, exuberant twenty-one-year-old, and we had this very and Godolsky was um, a very serious musician and, and not particularly fun to be around. And um, he took an instant dislike to Mario and in his autobiography, which he published in 1979, he he claimed that well, he'd, he'd heard, because Mario didn't do any recordings with him that came much later. He'd, he'd heard that the operatic recordings all had to be made from multiple takes and spliced together to make the semblance of an aria. Um, so it's made in small pieces. And, um, you know, because Godofsky had a reasonable musical reputation, you know, this, this kind of thing is damaging. And that that claim was republished uh, about 12 years ago in a book on Tanglewood. So the whole thing is, you know, for another generation now to read the Godofsky, Godofsky comments saying, uh, full of lies, saying, you know, small pieces, recordings made in small pieces, and saying that the, he had, uh, had to shorten the role of Fenton for Lanza, which was completely untrue because the New York Times reviewer, in fact, complained that the opera was given in full and it was over long. <laughs> It was definitely not cut. And, um, but Godofsky, you know, he was one of the people that spread this myth. And I think it comes back to what you were saying before about because he is so extraordinary, people look for reasons to, you know, to, to break that apart. So they, they think well, there must have been, there must be something. Ah, he made the recordings in small pieces. And Godofsky gives them this wonderful fuel for that myth. Which is completely dispelled by live recordings we have of yeah, them. But- all you have to do is look at the recording logs. I've got photocopies of half them here, and you can see what take number they were. The number of take ones that they released astounds me, really, that he had that much poise that he was able to record something difficult in one take. Perhaps it would have been good if he had done a few more retakes, a few endings, fixed a few things, but he didn't. Hmm. Almost never. How come he managed to sing the uh, duet from Butterfly, the Aldressioner aria live without any splicing? You know, <clears throat> how come he managed to do that? I mean, this is so ridiculous. I mean, the guy sang these concerts that we have, evidence is there, we've got it. 
you know, uh, uh, the Lesson Dharma at the 1948 uh, Hollywood Bowl is out of this world. Mm. Is that splice? I don't think so. That's live. <laughs> And uh, Marilyn Horn was there, by the way. I was. I yeah, love the fact she that she was there as a witness. And man, yeah. that voice! Yeah. Uh, it would have been a spinto voice. No, it was a spinto voice. Yeah. yeah she, she 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 clarified herself there. It was a spinto voice, and she just could not get over the, the sound. You know, she was in the chorus, the Hollywood Ball stage when he was doing that miraculous, you know, performance. Oh, I wish we had Florida. film footage of that. It, oh, if anything, no, I would love uh, film footage of the Holly Bowl. I do think that the Boris Godovsky quote aside, I do think this absolutely stems from Hollywood's mostly, most mostly their decision most of the time to show little sweet spots from areas because they didn't trust the audience to sit through the the performances. Yeah. And it does give the impression that, oh, if well, of course, anybody can cherry pick and sing that little phrase or this little moment from an aria. Actually, not everybody can. But no. I think that's where that myth and that illusion where he's singing bits of things, but yeah. he's capable of stamina of complete performances of singing straight through an evening. And it, it's again, it's one of those malicious, nasty chipping away at his legacy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to sing a complete uh, concert is no easy task. You know, you're singing, no. you're on your own in an opera. You have the, the other singers, the soprano, the baritone, the bass, uh, whatever, the orchestra. There's long pauses in a, in a concert. Yes, okay, you will take breaks. You sing two or three numbers, you have a break. But you're, you're on that stage for close to two hours singing a pretty demanding program, you know. You, you, you got to be unable to do that. Uh, no, he, he did it and very convincingly for many, many concerts in the 50s and again uh, later on in 1958. Uh, he proved, I mean, critics in, who was it, a the fellow there in, in Holland who couldn't stand him and he went to hear him and he said, well, I have to admit that this is truly... Uh, an amazing voice, uh, you know, powerful and twice the size of the Orling. Yeah, well, twice the size of the Orling. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. but yeah. you'll never convince these people that uh, are targeting him because that's it. It's just, it's just too big, too big a success, too big a target. So they're gonna keep sticking yes. needles into it. You will, you, we will never convince them. Never convince mm -hmm. them that this was a talent once. In a lifetime. Never. Well, we can try. Maybe it's my stubbornness, but I keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love I love Amando's subterfuge that he's used over the years of playing a lot yes. of recording, but telling them it's you know Manuel Garcia or somebody. Oh yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I did that. Uh, many I, I've times. done that too. I've I've been inspired by it and 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 I you know played things. People are like, God, who is that? Mm. Yeah, yeah. There was this fellow. Uh, I mean, we were friends and. Um, he uh, started off by uh, loving Lancer, but he had a bunch of snobbish friends that, uh, well, uh, Lancer is a film singer. So, you know, he felt, uh, hmm, they're making fun of me. And um, he sort of didn't want to be embarrassed by admitting that he liked him. And so he went along with them who were the Monaco fans of all people. Goodness. I knew, heaven, I knew he was going to come up. <laughs> please, please, please forgive me. Help me, the Monaco. <laughs> anyway, I remember one, one particular time, um, 
decided we decided that myself and a couple of other people we decided to play a joke on him and um went to his place and brought along a lancer recording of uh, operatic arias and uh, i said uh, you know we we, we just uh, bought this this recording this lp of this this tenor and um fantastic voice and uh, see what you think of it so we put on an answer and he goes wow oh, what a voice listen to that sound wow and it's so easy and ringing and the diction is perfect anyway he raved on for the for the entire 45 minutes that the lp lasted and then who is he? What, who, who, who is this? Uh, and I quickly thought of uh, he's, he's a Spanish tanner, Garcia, Manuel Garcia. <laughs> Manuel Garcia, who died about a hundred years earlier. He was a he was a teacher, but that's the first thing that came into my mind. <laughs> Fantastic. Why can I buy the record? I said, Well, actually, you can't. Why not? I said, because you if you do, you'll be laughed at by your snobbish friends. I said, you've been listening and raving on about Mario Lanza for the past 45 minutes. Impossible. Couldn't have been him. He was very embarrassed about it all because we made a total fool of him in front of the other. So that, really that's, a, to... that's a great trick to play. To, that says it all. That says Actually, it all. And I did, like that. Yeah. It does. Ah, prejudice. Mm -hmm. Prejudice, absolute and, prejudice. And just this, the what always goes along with the Lanza made recordings and small pieces. Just it's kind of like a, a a second point to that is that RCA or Hollywood had some magic button that you could push to make a singer sound amazing, which astounds me because they never used that magic button on anybody else, and <laughs> only Mario Lanza sounds as great as Mario Lanza. <laughs> That is the most ridiculous statement because, you know, you, you cannot change the basic color or timbre of a voice. You can make it louder. You can increase the, you know, the volume, but the volume is only going to change the basic color, which Lanza yeah. had. The real beauty, I think, in the Lanza voice and in any beautiful voice, the, the harmonics in there, that how... Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't change that by, by yeah. increasing that, the That's volume. what Kalea, yeah. Joseph Kalea said to me. You can tell it's a big voice by the harmonics of the voice. You can't, you can't fool, you can't, you can't fool anybody with that. That's, that's indisputable. And, you know, and if anything, I actually wish he had re been recorded better. I I, I I think he was recorded quite badly. Um, like it, with a, with a voice, with that, size and harmonics and 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 variation of color it's almost impossible to record i mean they tried and occasionally i do hear a recording i go okay i can th maybe assume that that's how he would sound in person but i think it was almost impossible to record so if anything Sammy i actually can. think he suffered from the technology yeah Sammy yeah. can the uh um the writer of the lyrics for the you know a lot of his songs said no um, microphone uh, could capture the real lanza voice the, the 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 incredible beauty and size of the lanza voice that's uh, right yeah no mechanical reproduction yeah that's what he said yeah yeah no so mechanical reproduction yeah, yeah. yeah that's right that's, i mean that <laughs> you know he he claimed on parkinson he <laughs> that the the sheer volume broke his glasses mm. um but it's you can believe it you believe it uh i think he said that when domingo was on he you know the song originally went there'll be no one but you for me eternally but when he sang the song to me he had an inner loud pedal inside of him <laughs> and when he knew he was startling you he stepped on the pedal so he said eternally he broke my glasses <laughs> He didn't break your glasses. He broke my glasses. Could I lie to you? Yes, you would. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's... No, again, it comes back to what, you know, that Klinikos's point about it, thinking a tremendous joke was being played on him because of the, 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 the just the quality of the sound. It's an unimaginable Even, And, and you know what? It, it, it's at its most obvious, the size and power, on the most primitive of the recordings, like his home yes. rehearsals. It's strange that, isn't it, that a professional recording wouldn't capture it as well. You can hear the size and power. Ready? Ready? 
Yes, you're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But another thing, you know, is do you really think that musicians, the likes of the Sabbath, Victor the Sabbath, the principal conductor and musical director of La Scala, Gaetano Merola, music director and conductor of the San Francisco Opera, would offer Lanza Andrea Chenier if he had a small voice? I don't think so. I think these two guys knew something about voices and music. You know, they would have offered him Almaviva in uh, <laughs> the Barber of Seville, <laughs> Nemorino in Elisir d'Amore, mm. Ernesto in mm. uh, Don Pasquale, and so on. Andre Chenier is a spin to row. Now, you know, that says it all. What small voice? Come on. It's great that he recorded with um, Lichal Benese too, I think, because, you know, you know, that's a, a myth-busting recording in a way to hear him working opposite somebody with you know with, with a hell of a career you know a great singing actress really and having her on record talking about the experience and about the voice and about the intelligence that, that and the fact that he had everything that one needs to be a great singer everything the only thing he needed was a, with coaching like every like every singer and uh but he had everything the temperament the diction the voice the size of the voice, every single thing that you need to be a great singer. And, and that, she had, a, and she had sang with uh, some of the big tenors of yeah, the day. Yeah, Gigi and Gigi. everybody. Um, she knew what she was talking about, and she made that point when people questioned the size of the voice. Look, I know, I sang with Gigi, I sang with all these people. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And um, she was a great champion. Yeah, she was. Radio. Yeah. And, and she and seemed to have a, a real love for him. Yeah. Maria la tua condanna, di che sei casta, casta lo so. Oh, she's a lovely person too. A very, very nice lady. I mean, Kirsten said some nice things too about him, but she was a bit more, you know, on the great diva. But the Albanese was really, really. I amazing. think I think Dorothy Kirsten suffered more than most that worked with Mario. Maybe Grayson would be up there with her. I think that people wanted to talk about Mario so much. I think that can sting a little bit if you've had a oh God, yes. a, a distinguished oh, yes, yes, career. Yes. Yeah. Yes, people don't uh, want yeah, to be talking about through, that going through uh, loud and clear because. Uh, Oh, you know, uh, everywhere I go, they're always asking me about Mario Lancer. I said, I had a career too, you know. I sang at the Met and uh, I did this and I did that. And uh, she was pretty full of herself, like, you know, uh, because I said to her, how come being allowed you to um, to come to uh, Hollywood to make the Great Caruso, to, to make a film? Well, because she needed my Toscas and my Manons, you know, that's the sort of person. But she did admit that it was a fabulous voice, she said, you know, because mm. I said to her, but didn't I say that he used to tire? What? No, 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 no. She's, she's, she thought, she actually was one of the ones that uh, probably expanded on the myth that he couldn't uh, learn a, a proper role. She said he could have had any, sang in any opera house that he wanted to, but he just couldn't learn a role or wouldn't learn a role. And I corrected her and I said, but hold on. I said, you know, he did sing, uh, what, where? So I told her about Fenton and Pinkerton. 
Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Who were the conductors? I said, well, Goldowski, oh, him. <laughs> she dismissed him, but she was uh, she never knew about the Pinkerton. He didn't go around telling people or boasting about what he had sung. It's interesting that, that you know, you think he would have mentioned, oh, by the way, I did, you know, because yes. he was you know, insecure about you know, about being in Hollywood, but he didn't. He didn't mention these things much. In one interview yeah. where he's talking about the roles that he's learned, he doesn't mention that he's just sung Pinkerton the year before. He mentions that he did Fenton. He's actually very modest about what he. I mean, I felt he should have mentioned it more often. That he had, yeah. if he had made a point of singling this out and in interviews. Look, I did actually. I have sung on the stage, you know. But he did he? Do these people realize? Just to, to wrap this up as regards the artist myths, do these people realize how damaging, like even a throwaway comment like Godovsky's or Kirsten's, that how damaging they are, that damaging somebody's professional reputation, it's just, and it's so unfounded, number one, and, and just malicious. Just another example, Kirsten, Kirsten calls him in her book, this cocky little tenor, she calls Lancer. She calls this Stefano, he was tall and uh, good looking. This Stefano was actually a centimeter shorter than Lanza, so <laughs> what tall, <laughs> cocky little bit. This just goes to show you, you know, what jealousy. she felt. Yeah. yeah. It's jealousy. She, That's she said, oh, you know, he was good looking, very good looking, but he was not my type. Uh, probably not, but... <laughs> mm. <laughs> This is yeah. from the autobiography in which she even lied, took, what, five years off her age? Oh, yes, yes, I did. You know, the fancy, you, you can, maybe you can say that in an interview or not even in an interview, but to, to put it in a, in a biography, autobiography yeah. for posterity, yeah. taking off, what is it, five years, I think she took yeah. off her yeah, age. We've, we've all done that. She's like, in the great Caruso, she's actually 40 years old, you know, but according to her, she was only, yeah, yes, yeah, she's older than him. But to be yeah. to be fair, she, she comes across very well in that film. And she did um, a good job. Yeah, she did a good I job. Uh, does, uh, I like I like what she does with that um, uh, English number that she Sweethearts, sings, uh, yes, that's a beautiful Victor Herbert yes, song, Sweethearts, that's yeah. Very, that's very well sung. Yeah. Well sung. Yeah. yeah, better than uh, Jeanette MacDonald anyway. Um, <laughs> Well, so, there you are speaking, speaking of small voices. You just you just mentioned a real <laughs> small voice. Yeah. <laughs> so that covers the six myths concerning Mario Lanza, the artist. Thank you, Armando, and thank you, Derek. I really enjoyed that. Next time, we might discuss the other four myths on MarioLanzaTenor.com, those concerning Mario Lanza, the man. Absolute, absolute pleasure. Thank you, Vince, for uh, you know, the, uh, your contribution as well. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, yes. Well, Fantastic moderator, Vince. Yeah, he's very good, isn't okay. he? Okay. <laughs> very, very. Bravo. <laughs> well Bravo. done, everybody.